The readings from Matthew, chapter 6, verses 19 to 34. And if you've got a church Bible with you, it's on page 971. Matthew, chapter 6, verses 19 to 34. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sue. Let's pray as we unpack this passage together. King of kings, would you speak to us through your word by the power of your Holy Spirit and show us how we can follow you in every area of our lives, including with our money. Amen. Good to see you all again. If you don't know me, my name is Sarah and I'm part of the congregation here at St. James's. And um, today, as we know, we are continuing with the celebrations of the coronation of King Charles yesterday. Did anybody buy any memorabilia? We've got bunting up here. Maybe you've got bunting up at home. Did anyone get, I don't know, a tea towel or a mug, a flag? Maybe a coin. Let me see if this works. Not yet. Can we have the next slide, Fiona? Um, have you seen the Charles coin? So um, the 50Ps are already in circulation, apparently, and I think some of the other coins, and you can buy these, obviously, special ones. Apparently, the notes won't come in to circulation until next year. Do you have any money with you? Can I ask you to have a look? If you um, get your wallet out or your bag, do you have, just get out a coin or a note or a bank card if that's what you have and um, just put it in your hand and, and have a look at it. Oh, I've just got a, a pound coin here. Most of these will have the late Queen Elizabeth on if you've got cash. So have a look and see what's there. There'll be 
probably an image, like I say, if you have cash, some words. If you have a bank card, it might be the name of your bank. Um, if it's uh, a coin or a note, though, it will be something to do with the late queen, probably. Maybe you're lucky and I've got one of the new ones. The money that we have, that we almost all of us carry around with us almost all the time, although increasingly in, in, in plastic form rather than cash, represents something, doesn't it? Um, the United Kingdom, the, the Bank of England. And the fact that we have this money, it says that we're part of something. Um, a system of money, of exchanging money for goods and services, and also a kingdom, a nation state. And by using that money, we're accepting ourselves as being part of that nation, that place, that economic system, by having and, and using money. Now, of course, some people have more money than others, and let's face it, we don't really like talking about it, even though it's so prevalent and part of our lives that I can ask most of you, and you've got it on you. So today, I really want us to reflect on money, who it belongs to, and how it might be relevant to us as Christians, and and so what, I suppose, what, that, what difference that might make to how we live and how we seek to follow Christ today. And um, as Simon said, I'm involved in this topic with my work. I lead an organization called the Just Money Movement, and um, I'm going to be drawing a lot on our um, resources today. It's a huge topic and I can only really scratch the surface today. So I'll be sharing our, our website and details and things at the end. And um, there are also at the back, as you go out, a few of these postcards which just have that written down. So you can take those away and do, um, do look us up and find out more if this is something that interests you. So Jesus talks a lot about money, actually. And in fact, he did say something about who was on our coins and what that meant. And I'll come back to that a bit later on. And um, in fact, throughout the Bible, we hear a lot about money, wealth, uh, economics. But as I say, we, don't, we often shy away from those topics, both in the church and in wider society. Um, we might think about giving in church and, and talk about that or giving to charity but even that's not very often. And today I really want us to face the topic head on um, and, and really some of the other aspects of money. I'll be touching on giving, but in particular, I want to focus on these three points. Money is part of our faith. The Bible says a lot about money. God cares about how we use money and that should be part of how we live out our faith and how we witness to the world. So we should be talking about it. We should be learning about it. We shouldn't be shying away from it. The passage that um, we read today reminds us to seek first God's kingdom and that our ultimate allegiance is to God and not to money. So even whilst we are celebrating a new earthly king this weekend, we need to think about how our ultimate allegiance is to God and God's kingdom. And so with our money, how can we make sure it doesn't have power over us? And in fact, that we use money to serve God. And then my final point, which is the other verse I want to focus on from our passage, Jesus tells us that where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. What does that mean? What does that mean in terms of whether our money is in line with our hearts, with our desire to love God, to live out that love in the world, um, in caring for others, and in caring for the created world as well? So, first of all, how then should we use um, money to live out our faith and to witness in the world? 
And as I say, it's a huge topic, and we can only scratch the surface in, um, in a short amount of time. But there are a few big uh, themes or principles that I want us to just touch on when we think about what the, the Bible says about money. Firstly, Scripture sets out repeatedly that money isn't ours. Ultimately, it's God's. Everything belongs to the Lord. Psalm 24 tells us that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. And in Psalm 50, it says, Every animal in the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. So in absolute terms, we own nothing, neither money nor possessions. That's the first thing. Secondly, there are um, lots of biblical principles about how to deal with money and wealth and how it can be shared in wider society. And we see, um, we see that in the Old Testament prophets who call for justice, for the people of God to act fairly, uh, to look after the poor and so on. And we have particularly the concepts of Sabbath and Jubilee where God ordains patterns of living well together um, including prioritizing people and land and animals for what they're worth inherently and not just their economic value. Um, so they have a chance to, to rest and inequalities are redressed um, that have built up. And thirdly, money and wealth are key themes, as we see today, in the teaching and ministry of Jesus. He begins his ministry in the, in the synagogue, doesn't he? And that was part of the passage actually in the coronation yesterday that was read, that he comes to bring good news to the poor. He tells a rich man to sell all his wealth. Um, he states that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who's rich to enter the kingdom of God. He denounces the money changers in the temple and um, another encounter with uh, someone called Zacchaeus, who's a tax collector, leads to that person giving away his money and making restitution where he might have misused his money. So there's, I mean, absolutely tons of examples that we could focus on and we can't do all of that today. But the point is, however we were to go into interpreting those passages, it's clear that money and wealth and economics are big themes in the Bible, big themes in Christian teaching. So the first thing I want to say really is let's talk about this more, let's hear more about it, let's learn more about it, let's think more about how this issue affects how we live out our faith as Christians. But let's get into today's passage and I want to focus on two particular phrases in particular where Jesus has some pretty strong words about money, doesn't he? So um, I'll take them in, in reverse order. The first one um, that I want to look at is, well, it's kind of, I've put two things together. So right at the end of the passage, we have this um, command to seek first God's kingdom. But there's this bit, isn't there, that you can't serve both God and money, or in some translations, mammon. And that is something interesting that I just want to dwell on a little bit. <clears throat> so Jesus characterizes money here as a person, as a power with a capital lettered name, Mammon. And what he's doing there is really demonstrating the influence that money can have over us. And um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, who led the coronation service yesterday, wrote a book uh, a few years ago now called Dethroning Mammon. I'd really recommend it, actually. And he talks about the power that money in that way, with a capital M, if you like, <coughs> can have over us, where it deceives us into wrong attitudes, where it leads us to value what we can measure, what has economic worth, and where we, where we are led to believe we can have, um, where we can control things, where we own our own wealth. And money in that way can be powerful. Those who hold wealth frequently do have more power than those who don't. So if we have money, we need to think really carefully about how we use it and the power that it gives us especially as we hear so often in scripture how God is on the side of the powerless. But at the same time, money can act as a power over us. And Paul says similarly, doesn't he, in his letter to Timothy, and this is often misquoted, but he actually says, the love of money, the love of money is at the root 
of all kinds of evil. And that's in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. But we know, don't we, that God is our king and that, as the passage says today, it's his kingdom we're called to seek first, above all other things. And I want to come back to this point about the coin that I mentioned at the beginning. There's that famous encounter, isn't there, where Jesus um, knows that he, the Pharisees are trying to trick him. And they ask him about paying taxes, paying Roman taxes. And he, he says back to them, well, who's on the coin? And they say, Caesar. And Jesus says to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. He kind of actually answers their trick with a tricky reply because, as we said before, everything ultimately belongs to God. Yes, we're called to serve earthly kings, to pay our taxes, but our ultimate allegiance is to the king of kings, and it's his kingdom and his values that we should be seeking. But does that mean that money is always a kind of evil power over us, that money with a capital M, that mammon? Well, no, Jesus didn't tell everyone to give all their wealth away. Um, there's a famous quote from John Wesley who says, money can be a gift from God and enables us to fulfill our mission. And we know that, don't we? In church, we need money uh, to do the things that we want to do, to serve the community, to witness to God in New Barnet. So it's not that, it's much more about our attitudes, our heart, and how that plays out in how we use money to serve God and seek his kingdom. So let's come on then to the other main um, uh, bits of this passage that I want to draw out this morning. And that Jesus urges his listeners not to um, store up treasures on earth. And he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So what does that mean? How can we align our treasure with our love of God and others and not just store up riches for ourselves? I'm going to come on to the practicalities of what that might look like in a minute. But to come back to some of the principles I've mentioned, that's what it would mean to be guided in our use of money by some of those big themes that Scripture teaches us. Everything is God's. We use money to serve God and not to let it have power over us. And so using it to do things that we're called to do in every area of our faith. Things like um, glorifying God, loving our neighbours and um, caring for creation. And we know and we've talked and we prayed this morning that our King Charles cares passionately about that in particular. I don't want to completely ignore the other part of this passage, which is that famous set of instructions from Jesus not to worry. We'll be much more content, much more peaceful, less anxious, Jesus seems to say, if we depend on God for our security instead of on material wealth, material things. We can be free of the power that money and things can have over us. That power can preoccupy us, deceive us and take away our joy. I would say that in the midst of a cost of living crisis where people are often really struggling, we need to be quite sensitive about this kind of teaching and just blanketly telling people not to worry about things isn't always the most um, caring approach. But the point is that our perspective should change. And if all of us lived by these priorities, seeking God's kingdom first, being generous, serving God and his kingdom values with our money, then perhaps, other, then perhaps people wouldn't need to be so anxious about their material well-being. So what does it mean to align our treasure with our heart? What does it mean to seek God with our money? And of course, that does include giving giving to church, giving to charity, being generous is at the heart of that and, and is a way of kind of avoiding the power that money can have over us. But what I want to focus on in the rest of this morning is, is kind of 
if you think about tithing, the other 90%, if you like, the rest of our money and what we might want to think about doing with that. Um, this, I don't know how well you can see that, but basically this is a kind of map of our, what's called our financial footprint. So um, in the middle of the circle, you've got all the sorts of things that we do with money. So our banking, our spending, our savings if we have them, charit charitable giving, our pension, and then around the side is the kind of world that those uh, interactions with money, if you like, those financial footprints, the kind of world our money is shaping, which sadly includes things like the climate crisis, um, plastic pollution, inequality, violence. So if we don't think about our money, if we don't think about what we're doing with it, it does shape a particular kind of world. It just might not be the kind of world that we want it to be, where we're glorifying God, loving our neighbors near and far, and caring for creation. So I want to talk about three very practical steps. And as I say, this is just scratching the surface, so do have a look at our website to find out more. But three areas where we all use money, or most of us use money, and, and are part, therefore, of shaping a world and what we might think about doing differently. So, shopping. And the quote there says, spend the world you want into reality. We, can, we are connected to people, to our neighbors, whether that's local or global neighbors, every time we shop, every time we spend money. They might be farmers, uh, farming for um, the food that we end up eating, uh, people in, in, who are mining for parts for our mobile phones or computers, uh, people working in companies that we buy branded goods from. Every time we shop, we are making a choice about the world we want to be in reality. So I've just put up there a few labels we can look for, because this is a, a huge topic and a bit of a, um, yeah, there's lots of things to consider. And I suppose I would say, come back to those first principles. How are we glorifying God, loving our neighbor, and caring for creation with our shopping? And you can look out for the fair trademark there, um, organic textile standard, um, FSC certified, the RSPCA assured symbol, and the Soil Association. Those are some of the labels. And we have a whole guide on ethical shopping on our website that you can look at as well. So have a think. Uh, first of all, do you need to spend money? Do you need to buy the thing you're going to buy? And then secondly, what is the impact that's having on our neighbors and on the created world. The second area that I want to touch on is, our, um, is banking. Most people in the UK have a bank account. And through that bank account, the money, often we don't think about it at all. And if we have any sort of picture in our heads, it's probably, um, if truth be told, of a kind of vault somewhere and our money sitting in it, right? And obviously we know that isn't true, but we don't really think about what the bank is doing with our money. Um, it's not just sitting there. And the banks, for example, are invested to the tune of trillions in fossil fuels. Um, they're also financing plastics industry and this is the one I want to talk about because at the Just Money movement we're really looking at this at the moment. So big banks like uh, HSBC, uh, Barclays, are funding 790 million dollars a day the plastics industry. Now we've made changes here at St. James's haven't we? We try to bring our keep cups, we try to change the way we're um, using, you know, maybe taking a, a reusable water bottle around with us. But if the banks are financing single-use plastic to the tune of hundreds of billions of, hundreds of millions of dollars every day, then we're really sort of blind to a whole other area of the way in which um, pollution is affecting our oceans, 
um, our own health and as well as connected to the climate crisis. And the photo there is me actually just on Friday at the HSBC AGM in Birmingham. And we went and we, um, I actually went into the AGM and asked the, the board a question about what they were doing about plastic pollution. So there are ways that you can engage as a campaigner, but also as a customer, you can contact your own bank, see what they're doing about the things that you care about, whether that's, it might be plastic pollution in the climate, it might be around the arms trade, it might be around all kinds of different issues. Find out, get, um, get well informed. There are also ethical banks that you can switch to, so you can think about that too. Um, and there are non-traditional kinds of finance too. There are credit unions, there are different sorts of responsible finance uh, organisations that you can find out about. It can feel complicated and a little bit difficult to know where to start, but you, can, you, have, uh, you have power as a, as a customer, as a financial customer and as a citizen to make a difference in your banking. And the final one I want to mention is uh, savings and investments. And as it says here, we probably don't see ourselves as investors, do we? I mean, you know, there's a few people who might be kind of super rich, but most of us, we're not investors. But actually, we are investors, as I've mentioned, through our banks. But also, especially now with um, auto-enrollment, if you're in employment, you're probably in a workplace pension scheme. And the pensions industry is enormous. There's about £2.7 trillion pounds invested in UK pensions. So that really is shaping the world around us. It's creating a reality that might not be one, that is glorifying God, loving our neighbours, and caring for creation. Because in fact, if we haven't made a choice, if we haven't looked into it, our money is probably invested in um, fossil fuels, in mining, it might be invested in the arms trade, all sorts of things that we might not be very comfortable with. So again, find out. Find out if you have an ethical fund you can switch your pension into. Find out what your options are. Have a look on the Just Money website to see what you can do. So let's come back to those um, three points that I started with then. God cares about money. The Bible has a huge amount to say about money. It's a really important topic. So let's find out more about it. Uh, let's not shy away from it. Let's learn. Let's reflect. Let's open our eyes to this whole area of how we're called to live out our faith and witness to the world. God is the king of kings, and we serve him, not money. So let's give our ultimate allegiance to the King of Kings in every area of our lives, including with our money. And let's put our treasure where our heart is. Let's make sure that our money, whether that's the money we spend in the shops, the money in our bank account, the money in our pension fund, is going towards things that glorify God and his kingdom. And as I say, finally, do, um, do have a look on the website justmoney.org.uk. Do take a postcard that's at the back. Uh, do drop us a line or just come and, and talk to me at the end. So let's pray. God of all things, King of kings, would you be Lord over our money as over every aspect of our lives? Would you show us where we can take action to glorify you, to love one another, and to care for your creation? Show us how we can put our treasure where our hearts are. In your name we pray. Amen. Fantastic from, from Sarah there. Isn't it, isn't it great that we've got such experts in our congregation who can bring us so many different things from so many different perspectives of life? And if there are things that you think, maybe I've got a real passion for this, I've, I've been thinking about this for ages and we never talk about this at church, then come talk to me, come talk to Laura. Bring your passion, bring your skills. I personally am going to be looking at this pound coin in my pocket and thinking, what was it? 
Shopping, banking, saving. Where is that pound going to go? So, <clears throat> final challenge. Who are we going to follow? Who are we going to make the king of our lives? We need to think about that. We need to think about that with our money and with all the things that we do. But we need to pray for the king and all of those in authority that they would bow before Christ the king as well. So we'll end with a prayer and a final blessing. Gracious God, in company with our King, we rededicate ourselves to your service. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you and your kingdom. That here we may have your peace and in the world to come may see you face to face through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And finally, a blessing which is based on the one that Justin Welby prayed yesterday for the King, but I think applies for us today. Christ our King, make you faithful and strong to do his will, that you may live with him in glory. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest upon you and all whom you serve, this day and all your days. Amen.